Uh, all right, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us from wherever you are, uh, whichever part of the world you are right now. Uh, my name is Panga, and I will be uh, moderating this talk titled uh, "The Materiality in Primorian Java" by uh, Wayanjar Sastrawan, and uh, this talk is part of a series co-organized co by uh, the uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies and uh, Southeast Asian Art Academic Program at SOAS. And uh, to give more introduction to uh, this series, I would like to invite uh, Christian Lustenik uh, from uh, SOAS University of London to give uh, a bit of uh, introduction to uh, this seminar series. Uh, Christian, time is yours. Uh, thank you, Panga. Uh, I'm just to introduce myself, I'm Christian Lutzenitz. I'm senior lecturer in Tibetan and Buddhist art here at uh, SOAS, at the School of Arts and uh, the Department of the History of Art and Archaeology. Uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of shortly give an introduction to uh, the first, the uh, Southeast Asian Art Academic Program, uh, funded by the Alpha Wood Foundation that uh, not only funded kind of three uh, endowed academic posts, mine included, and that of Professor Ashley Thompson, Hiram W. Wood uh, Woodward Chair in Southeast Asian Art, who is on research leave currently, so I'm kind of replacing her uh, in, in uh, introducing the series. Uh, the aim of uh, SAP, as it is uh, shortly called, uh, is understanding the preservation of ancient and pre-modern Buddhist and Hindu art and architecture in Southeast Asia. Uh, the Alpha Wood program was associated with uh, more than 90 scholarships between uh, 2014 and 2019 for students from Southeast Asia, some of which now organize uh, this uh, uh, lecture series. And currently uh, it is a reduced program on, of three to four scholarships per annum. I also wanted to point out uh, two uh, publication series that are now organized. Uh, one is uh, Pratu, the Journal of uh, Buddhist and Hindu Art, Architecture and Archaeology of Ancient uh, to Pre-Modern Southeast Asia. It's a postgraduate journal run by postgraduates, as is uh, this particular seminar. And the other one is a joint series uh, with the National University of Singapore Press. Uh, the first publication actually edited by Panga and uh, Louis Didacott, uh, who was another uh, of the, uh, the three endowed uh, chairs, uh, will be coming out in uh, this month. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, of course, this uh, uh, re uh, seminar today is part of, of a seminar series, as said by the uh, Center of Southeast Asian Studies uh, or program. Uh, and uh, it's enabled uh, through Alpha Wood funding as well. Uh, the series itself and the organization is led by uh, uh, postdoc uh, students and alumni, uh, namely Odom Lo Kuntrakol, Heidi Tan, uh, Pibat Krajechun, and uh, Panga Adiancia. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, with this, I can. Uh, kind of give over to Banga, who will uh, kind of lead through the talk itself. Thank you, Christian, and thank you for uh, introducing uh, the uh, series that we are trying to uh, organize uh, for this uh, period of time. And hopefully uh, it can be uh, as exciting as it is, uh, as we are currently also excited to have this uh, seminar series right now and so as. And I'm sorry also for <laughs> pulling you up from your lectures. Uh, so I'm just gonna relieve you from uh, this stream and then uh, we can have the talk uh, after this. Thank you, Christian. Thank you.
All right. Uh, so, like we already announced and promote, uh, we have uh, Wayan Jarah Sastrawan with us today. Thank you for uh, coming to have to this seminar, Jarah. Thank you very much, Panga. Uh, thank you to SOAS for inviting me um, and for all your organization behind the scenes and also to Aum and, uh, and the others who helped put this together. Yeah, uh, it's it's been a long time coming, right? I mean, like it has. Uh, you, it's already proper originally scheduled on in March, and then because of the uh, COVID situation, we have to postpone it, and then finally we decided to do it now uh, using an online platform, right? Like this one. And uh, thank you for being patient with us for that oh. matter. No, it's <laughs> okay. my pleasure. Uh, a little bit of introduction of Jara. So Jara is a PhD candidate in the uh, unit in the Asian history of uh, University of Sydney. And then his research focuses on the historical writing practices of pre-modern Southeast Asians, uh, specializing in texts written in Malay, Japanese, and Balinese. He's also interested in the theory of history, uh, the environmental and economic history of Southeast Asia, uh, modern Indonesian history and also Indonesian popular music. I guess that includes Dangdut or not? It definitely does, absolutely. <laughs> yes. yes, I know that because we've been <laughs> Dangduting together, right? We have indeed. Yeah. And as you also may aware as well, uh, Jara is also one of the founder and editor of the uh, respective of the past uh, blogs that are now currently integrated into a uh, new mandala. All right, um, Jara, are you ready? Absolutely. Okay, let's start with it then. All right. Thanks very much, Panga. Uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, who's tuned in today. Um, I'm very excited to to be with you and to share some of my work. So, uh, let me. I'm see. I now full screen. Uh, let me share my screen for the PowerPoint presentation. Bear with me. Uh, so, Panga, let me know if there's any problems with the uh, with the presentation. Um, yeah, it's good. Thanks. All right. So today, um, as Panga introduced, I'm a I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney, and my my doctoral research focuses specifically on the history writing of pre-modern Javanese. So I'm interested in the ways in which the Javanese wrote history the way that they used sources, the way that they understood and conceptualized the past. So I come very much from a textual studies uh, background. Uh, my undergrad was in literature and in languages, and now moving into uh, text-focused historical work. So my, my reason for coming to materiality uh, was sort of in a sideways manner. I was not originally a scholar of material culture at all, and I still don't have any claim to expertise in the study of, say, art history or archaeology. But as a textual scholar, I found uh, that materiality, and especially the materiality of writing practices, has become something that's become crucially important to my work in working with texts and working in history. So today I wanted to share a bit about how that came about and what I think some of the important implications are when we're thinking about materiality of writing and how that relates to the study of history, uh, specifically in pre-modern Java. So this is the sort of broad conceptual way that the talk is going to go. I, what I'm interested in is looking at how the materiality of writing influenced and affected the writing of history. This is the sort of, uh, this is the basic uh, basic thread of the argument that I want to push. So just to give a brief outline, uh, I'll introduce pre-modern Java as a setting. Um, since this is a talk about Southeast Asia and within the context of a Southeast Asia program, I won't go into too much detail, but I recognize that many people will be coming uh, from a, a non-Javanese background. So I'll just give an introduction to the setting, the cultural and social setting of my study that emphasizes a few important features. Then I'll go into a bit of depth about what I mean by the materiality of writing. Um, you'll find that I end up with quite a sort of layman's or a common sense understanding of materiality, but one that I think 
is illuminating and is worth going into in a bit of depth. And finally, I want to introduce this notion of the precarity of the past. I want to put forward the hypothesis or the theory that for pre-modern Javanese, the past was a precarious thing. It was often on the brink of disappearance. It was difficult to grasp, difficult to find, and difficult to discover. And I want to link that historical problem, which affected both the pre-modern Javanese as they sought to study their past, and also it affects us as modern scholars trying to study the past. How this precarity is tightly bound up in the materiality of writing. So that's how the talk is going to go. But first, let me introduce pre-modern Java. So uh, I don't think I need to show you a map of where Java is, um, although it's sometimes necessary for some audiences. But I think that what I wanted to emphasize here is what I mean when I say pre-modern, uh, this is a term I use to talk about what others call the Hindu Buddhist period, uh, sometimes the Indic period, basically the period of Javanese history between the 5th century, with the first written records that have survived, and around the 15th century, which is when the last powerful kingdoms of uh, Hindu Buddhist orientation began to decline and fall. So this is the rough about a thousand years between the middle of the first and the middle of the second millennium. And I wanted to emphasize a few characteristics of pre-modern Java as a society. The first is that pre-modern Java was a, a state and a society that had the ability to organize resources on a very large scale. Uh, it was a, pop, uh, a society of relatively high population density, especially in the agricultural areas of central Java and of East Java. And it was able to leverage economic resources uh, and economic surpluses in order to produce highly sophisticated and high capital, high value works, such as uh, the image you see before you, Borobudur, and other many other works of monumental temple architecture, a great deal of other kinds of material culture that have survived to the present day, which indicate the wealth, the high level of organization of Javanese society. And I want to emphasize this because the study of Southeast Asian history often emphasizes the fragility or the ephemerality of Southeast Asian states when compared to other uh, states in other parts of the world, their lack of, of bureaucracies and their personalized nature. But in my view, for at least for pre-modern Java, we have quite clear evidence of a, of a society that was highly complex highly organized, one in which the state understood broadly played a large, a major role in people's lives uh, and through other kinds of quasi-state or, or uh, institutions side by side with the state, such as religious foundations, monasteries, village organizations, rural corporations, and those sorts of things. The state and the society had an ability to leverage resources on a huge scale. Correlated with this is a clear fact of very close relationships between Java and the rest of the world. This is a, a relief from Borobudur, one of the, the several reliefs that depict ships. Because Java is an island, naturally its connections with the rest of the world were by sea. And in, the, in recent decades, with, uh, with the discovery of a few important shipwrecks in the Java Sea uh, and in the archipelago, we are getting a better and better understanding of why and how the Javanese were connected by sea. And this idea of connections involves is important because it, it relates to the manner of cultural sharing between Java and other parts of the world. An important example of that is what used to be called Indianization uh, and then later called localization and nowadays called the Sanskrit cosmopolis or other kinds of cosmos. Well, these are all different terms used to try to describe with different emphases the kinds of cultural connections between Java and other parts of the world that we can see, for example, through recognizable art and architecture, and very importantly for my purposes, writing. So I wanna make this point as well, that for pre-modern Javanese, access to literacy was relatively widely spread. 
This does not mean that every that many Javanese in the pre-modern period would be able to write themselves. In fact, we have no way of knowing what literacy rates were. But if we look at the documents that survive from pre-modern Java, such as this inscription from the late 8th century, we find, and, and many others of this period and a bit later, we find that it's not writing is not something that pertains only to the palaces and the kings and the Brahmins and a tiny elite. The kinds of people mentioned in inscriptions and talked about in inscriptions and depicted as having an, a stake and an interest in the economic relationships and the political relationships that inscriptions entail were, were, were of a relatively broad cast of society, uh, going all the way down, if you want to use that metaphor, to leaders of villages. So I wanted to make the point because, uh, again, we often we often get the sense that Southeast Asians or, or Javanese, say in particular, uh, especially oral per people, that their culture is deeply rooted in oral traditions, which is of course true. But that doesn't mean to say that literacy therefore was strange or unfamiliar. Um, I wanna make the suggestion that actually literacy, even if not directly accessible to everybody, was it indirectly at least accessible to many, many people and not just exclusively locked away in, uh, in palaces and, and in courtly centers. And uh, this idea is important because what I wanna talk about now is the sort of the, uh, the first main body of, of my talk, which is about the materiality of writing. So what do I mean by materiality of writing? Uh, what, are, what are the materials that, that go into writing? I'm interested in things like writing surfaces, so paper, palm leaf, metal, stone, the kinds of things that, that you actually physically write on. I'm interested in the formats of written texts, so whether how they're put together physically. I'm interested in the tools that were used, whether they were incised, you know, cut into the palm leaf, or whether they were uh, painted on with ink, for example. But most importantly, for my purposes is that I'm interested in the durability of writing. Writing is different to oral, to speech, to oral presentation. It's different to memory. It's different because something which is written down has an innate durability, not an infinite one. So all pieces of writing, all written objects eventually degrade, decay, and are destroyed but it is not by nature ephemeral. Writing has a duration, and this becomes really important when we compare different types of material used for writing. What is their durability? How long do they last? And on what context and how do they last? Becomes a really important and will be a central theme of the talk. So how do we approach pre-modern writing? The obvious way is to look at examples of pre-modern writing, and I will do that shortly, looking at inscriptions, written on stone and metal that were created in the pre-modern period and which we can still read today and understand and, uh, and interpret them. But this is not the full story because many, many texts that were produced in the pre-modern period no longer exist. So we have to use other approaches. We have to look at modern practices of writing and modern the, the materiality of writing in a more modern period such as the 18th or the 19th century, from which many, many more manuscripts still exist. So we'll look at those modern ways of doing writing, of practicing writing, and extrapolate backwards. But we always have to be cautious when we do that. We can also look at visual depictions. So images, artistic images of books, of writing, of manuscripts in the pre-modern period, and infer what, for example, formats might have looked like. And we can also use poetic descriptions, so old poems, poems in old Javanese from this period, in order to see how people describe the act of writing. So I'm gonna use all, all four of these to, to kind of approach the question, how did the Javanese write in the pre-modern period and what was the materiality of those writing practices? So let me just talk about a few different kinds of writing surface. Some of the most impressive inscriptions we have from Java are carved on stone. This is the Chia Rutun inscription from West Java with a beautiful uh, lithic script uh, issued by uh, a king, Purnavarman, probably of the fifth or sixth century, and a number of, of ornamentations. So this sort of document was produced 
in an official context by a ruler in order to glorify and to leave a memorial and a mark to the achievements of particular kings. And uh, this is written in Sanskrit uh, with a with uh, a southern Brahmi script. So we have in the document itself, in the context in which this huge boulder uh, was found in the in the river. Uh, clearly, it's been in situ since it was since it was between the time it was produced and the time it was discovered, in order to commemorate an important event, uh, an important intervention by the ruler in the organization of the waterway here. Another important type of surface used is metal, of very often bronze uh, or some sort of copper alloy that, that is generically called copper plate, but, but is generally an alloy rather than pure copper. And these documents from Java tend to be of an administrative nature. They're often about land transfers of different kinds or the giving of privileges, economic privileges from one party to another, often from the king, but not always to a subject. So texts on metal were produced professionally very often. So they were produced by a, a professional scribe on behalf of the beneficiary, because the idea is that you get issued a metal inscription, a copper plate inscription as a guarantee of the rights that you have received in that document. So then you can keep that and you can show it to your children and their, your grandchildren and your descendants will maintain and preserve that record because that written record guarantees their right to whatever piece of land they may have been given or their ancestor was given. So we see here how the, the physical durability of the document is a crucial consideration for its legal value and its legal function, which I'll come to a bit later. Now, those are the two types of, of inscription that have survived types of writing surfaces that have survived. There are others such as gold and clay, but they fall into those categories. The majority of texts were probably not written on stone or metal, but on organic materials, which, for which I use a generic term ripta that comes out of the, the uh, literature, the inscriptional literature. And these largely don't survive. The, one of the oldest ones is the one I show here, the, the bark cloth, uh, which has been dated in the 14th or 15th century. But by and large, there, we have almost no examples of manuscripts on palm leaf, of, on bark cloth, on paper, from anywhere before 500 years ago, at the very, very oldest. So it's quite a different situation to the others. And we can see here a number of different alternatives. So two different kinds of palm leaf, depending on which type of palm was more prevalent in different parts of the island of Java, bark cloth not used very much in the Hindu Buddhist period, but much more popular in the Islamic period in Java. And in addition to those different formats. So we have uh, a few examples of concertina format books. Uh, that's from North Sumatra, uh, a cassette sort of rolled palm leaf from, from Sulawesi and incised bamboo from other parts of the archipelago. So we're going a bit broader afield than Java to show how different formats may have been used. These examples are all modern, by the way. So these are all not pre-modern, not old. These are 19th or 20th century. So this is how we might go about extrapolating backwards from modern traditions and making some conjectures about the sorts of formats that might have been available in an earlier time. We do have a little bit of textual evidence, though not very much. Uh, an important didactic text from West Java in the 16th century, written in old Sundanese, talks about the variety of writing surfaces that were available and which one could use. Gold, silver, copper, bronze, uh, these are known. Steel and iron, we don't really have very many examples of those being used. It's quite hard to imagine how because they're very hard, but you know, you never know. One can imagine uh, chrises and weapons and steel objects of that kind being inscribed. Stone, extremely common. Wooden boards, also known. Uh, there are a couple in Bali at least. Bamboo, uh, known but no longer extant, and same with the two types of palm leaf. So this sort of gives us a bit of validation that some of the, the more modern formats and forms and surfaces on which writing was done may have also been known and in use at the 16th century at the latest, and potentially also earlier than that.
The second approach, um, second indirect approach, if you like, is through visual depiction. So temporal reliefs in Java show a number of things that we uh, can interpret as being very likely to be kinds of manuscripts. So here looks like this looks very much like a palm leaf manuscript. Uh, we don't know whether the size is is uh, realistic or naturalistic compared to the human figure. If it is, it looks a bit more like one of the larger larger palm leaf manuscripts you get from South Asia rather than the smaller ones from Indonesia. We have a number of depictions of such. And we can see here that the crisscrossing uh, cord around the palm leaf manuscript, if it is in fact a palm leaf manuscript, looks quite familiar. Here we see what looks like a small number of palm leaves being held in the hand of these figures. And you can see that the ends a droop, they bend under their own weight and gravity. So all of this makes us think, yeah, this is sort of what palm leaf manuscripts are like. And then we have a later, a later image from the 14th century likely of what was like a slightly smaller palm leaf manuscript. But similarly, all have this long rectangular shape, uh, clearly to be read uh, along the length rather than down the, uh, you know, up and down. So this gives us some sort of confidence that palm leaf uh, in the way that we know it and the sorts of formats we're familiar with, especially from Bali, but also from certain areas in Java, were known also in these pre-modern times. But it's not all a nice self-consistent story. It doesn't fit all neatly together. Old Javanese poetry has a number of terms for writing, and writing is talked about quite a lot. Uh, lots of people write love poems and other kinds of text uh, as depicted in old Javanese poetry, and the terms that they use don't seem to fit very nicely. So this word karas and tanah come up all the time, and these seem to be a sort of writing board uh, with a pencil rather than what we know in, in palm leaf manuscripts being scratched in with a stylus with an iron knife. So it's a bit different. There's discussions of using pandanas petals to write love poems. We don't know if that's realistic or not. It might just be an imaginative sort of trope, but if it, even if it were real, there's no way we could prove it because such petals obviously degrade very quickly. And there are also another, a couple of different kinds of uh, of terms that are used to describe things that we don't have much evidence for still existing. So we use these sort of different ways of, of approaching pre-modern writing practices, but we're not sure exactly uh, how it all fits together. This is one of the difficulties of studying materiality when the materials are no longer completely extant. Um, we have to use these indirect methods, and the indirect methods don't necessarily bring us to a nice self-consistent conclusion. Remember that because that, that issue is going to come up very importantly once again. So the one thing that I really want to emphasize is that the organic materials, which as you remember I called ripta, this is based on the term used in these inscriptions, was vulnerable to decay. This is not just my hypothesis, it's stated explicitly in copper and stone charters. A number of them, as you see here, say the text of this document was originally on ripta, originally on organic materials, perhaps palm leaf, but because that palm leaf document, that riptile became rotten, because it became illegible, because it was decayed and damaged, we had to copy the text onto something more permanent, stone or copper or metal. So here we have a very strong awareness that the durability of the material on which a text is written has huge implications for the text on which, that it contains. These Charters, these documents, are about people's legal rights to land, they're about their families' rights, they're about their relationships with the state. These are very serious matters. And so it's very important that the, the text that guarantees those rights, the contracts or whatever, are written on a, on a material that is durable and permanent. Clearly, in very many cases, Ripta fails to perform this function of permanence and durability. And that's why when we look at the, the whole documents that we have for the pre-modern period, almost every single one is on, is on metal or stone. We have almost no remaining palm leaf, riptar, paperback, anything. Texts 
from the pre-modern Javanese period before the end of the 15th century. So clearly the concerns that these people had, uh, the, the people who wrote these, these inscriptions about how the, the Ripta had gone rotten, those concerns were very well placed. So that issue is the key one that brings me into the second part of the talk, which is how does the materiality of writing affect the writing of history? I foreshadowed this problem by talking about the vulnerability of Ripta. My claim, and one that I've argued for and one I'm arguing for in my thesis and will keep arguing for in subsequent work, is that the past was precarious for Javanese people. And what I mean by that is that for the Javanese of the pre-modern period, they had difficulty finding out information about things that had happened in the past. So it's not just us culturally distant in a kind of modern industrial society that struggled to understand past events in pre-modern Java. Also, Javanese themselves back then had difficulty accessing and discovering and finding the information that they desired about things that had happened in their own pasts, maybe even as recently as 100 or 200 years before their own lifetimes. And this was the case for a number of reasons. The first one is precisely the vulnerability of Ripta problem that I talked about. Because most documents were written on organic materials, uh, the majority of them were written on such because that was accessible, it was cheap, and for administration, you want to produce documents in bulk. But the downside, the trade-off for that ease of documentation is the fact that those documents don't last a long time unless you copy them onto stone and copper. So we can, we can believe, and I think with justification believe, that a great deal of records were produced by the Javanese state and by Javanese people throughout the pre-modern period, and they have been lost. The original documents have been lost. So although we have a great deal of literature and poetry and other kinds of texts from as early as the 10th or 9th, 9th or 10th century in Java, in manuscript form, those are not the original physical documents that were produced there. Those are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, such as this text, a Balinese copy of old Javanese material. So the original document was lost, and it's only if the text was copied many, many times over different iterations so over the centuries did it survive. And it seems to be the case that very few historical or legal documents survive. Many poems survived because poems are of a general nature. They appeal to lots of people. Everybody loves the Ramayana, for example. So the Ramayana was copied over and over again in many contexts. But documents like land tenure, like chronicles of specific courts and specific families, these did not survive quite so well. And the reason is because they were physically vulnerable. Right. So the original record decayed, was destroyed, and if nobody had copied it before that happened, the contents were lost forever. It was not possible to regain it. If you have a unique original record of something and you don't copy it in time, then when the, the insects or the termites or the rats or the climate eats away at that original record, it's gone forever like this one. So that's really a crucial consideration. Another really important fact is that the archive of pre-modern Java is not centralized and was, seems not to have been centralized very much. And we, as modern historians, when we want to reconstruct the history of Majapahit, for example, or the history of Mataram, we use stone and metal inscriptions, like I mentioned before. But those inscriptions are not all in one place. They're not all stored in the capital at Majapahit. They're dispersed throughout the countryside because many of them pertain to relationships over land and rural, rural institutions and economies. And as such, they were placed in the places that they pertain to. This is not just recent. We have evidence from the 14th century of monks and other people having to travel to distant estates in order to, to discover facts about other parts of their history. This photo is of Singasari, uh, the major temple near Malang. And this is the site where 
in the 14th century, a Buddhist monk called Prapancha, who later wrote a poem that we still have, talked about how he visited this particular temple and asked the person there, please tell me about the history of the dynasty. So even as a person who was based at Majapahit, who was a servant of the King Hayam Wuruk, Prapancha did not have access, seems not to have access to basic information about the dynasty. He had to go all the way to Malang, all the way to Singosari to discover these things. So that shows the extent to which the archive was not all in one place easily accessible. In order to discover a kind of comprehensive set of sources for the history of Java, one had to travel almost constantly throughout the countryside to all these local archives everywhere. And this meant that the cost of finding out the full, the full picture, the full story of the past was very high. This was another barrier, another hindrance to the study of the past. And this is another reason why the past was precarious. Even if the documents survived, which they often didn't, then you still have to go travel vast distances in order to even know that they existed. There's, there seems to be no, no evidence of, 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 of very many efforts to uh, catalog to centralize, to, to organize the existent historical archive in pre-modern Java, as for example, was very much the case in Imperial China, for example. Now, another really important consideration is about orality and memory. So I mentioned before, I emphasized the literate nature of pre-modern Javanese society, and I stand by that. Orality and memory played a really important role in which, which that was intertwined with writing. So rather than having a sort of an oral culture and a literate culture, we find that information was often transmitted through a combination of oral, written, and memorial means, and also visual art, for example. So we have the same stories, the same narratives expressed in, in oral form, sometimes through performance, we have it memorized and told orally again. We also have it written down and copied from manuscript to manuscript. With some texts, we can see how the, a single text itself has gone through stages of being expressed in oral form and then being expressed in written form. The way in which the text is put together, the use of poetic meter, the, the repetition of certain formulaic expressions, the divergences in the, in the accounts, all give us to think yeah, this text has originally had uh, an oral basis, but was later written down. This is common to many pre-modern cultures in the world, even, even modern cultures. But I wanted to emphasize this because it meant that for many Javanese trying to learn about the past, they could not depend only on written sources. Unlike a modern historian who focuses primarily on what we call primary sources, by which we conventionally mean written documents produced at the time of the events we want to study, that was not really a possibility for Javanese historians. They were difficult to gain access to those documents. And by and large, people learned about the past through oral means, uh, by remembering a story that was told to them and writing it down later, or by having people show them documents which then they committed to memory or paraphrased in speech at a later time. And then those documents over the centuries turned into the historical traditions that we use today. So manuscripts, poems, chronicles were written that drew on information of a variety of sources, not just primary written sources, but also oral traditions, also traditions of memorialization of kings and of places and of sages and that kind of thing. So it's a very complicated way in which information about the past was transmitted. And I characterize it as precarious because it meant that the Javanese historians, Javanese people trying to understand their past, had to contend with all these limitations and difficulties. And that's not necessarily a negative thing, but it did mean that they faced unique or distinctive circumstances. Perhaps not unique because some of these things, many of these factors are found in other societies in the world too but certainly distinctive and certainly different to what we expect. And what that means is that we have to think about the consequences. If the past was precarious in the manner that I described, 
if it was difficult to gain knowledge of the past as I described, then what are the consequences of that? Firstly, it meant that the historical record was highly fragmentary, and it still is today. There are huge chunks of pre-modern Javanese history for which we have no records, and then certain periods for which we have lots. The reigns of certain kings, for example, Elanga in the early 11th century, um, Balitung in the early 10th century, Radin Wijaya in the late 13th, early 14th century, we have heaps of records from their time. But then other periods of history, we have almost nothing. And so this fragmentariness makes it very difficult to talk about history as a whole and to trace its development. Another really important problem, consequence that I want to focus on shortly is about conflicting versions. So even the documents that did survive, so many, so much did not survive, but even that which did survive presents these conflicting versions and not just conflicting in terms of perspective, in terms of you know, a pro-king or an anti-king perspective, right-wing or a left-wing perspective. Even the basic statements of what happened when uh, were conflicting within the same tradition and sometimes even within the same source. And the reason this happened was because the past was precarious, because when you don't have an original written document, an authoritative written document that says this is the day on which this happened, then when you have different versions, you can't adjudicate between them. You can't work out which one is right because there's no authoritative original to go back to. If people are saying one thing in that village and a different thing in another village, who's to say who's more accurate when you don't have a connection back to the original document? So I'll talk about that to kind of to round out the discussion shortly. The effect of these two issues, the fragmentariness and the conflicting nature of the record, meant that as modern historians, at least for the last 200 years, scholars have been uncertain about the reliability of sources, that we have struggled to make a good judgment about whether or not we can trust a particular source. And the reason is because of their fragmentariness, because they don't seem to give us a complete picture of what's going on. And so we have this suspicion that we're missing out on the other side of the story. We have this idea that the sources are sort of one-sided and that's not necessarily because they are, it's simply because we, we lack the opposing view. We, we don't have, we don't hear the other side of the story and so this makes us uncomfortable that maybe we're not hearing the full, the full narrative. And it also where conflicts do exist, they're of a such profound nature that it leads us to doubt whether or not the text is even reliable in anything it says. When we see a text with a deeply problematic chronology, for example, with very confused dates, some of which don't make sense and don't line up, this, this, this leads to a kind of a, a powerful suspicion among historians that the text is not actually very useful or worthwhile. Javanese, historians of Java have argued about this for so long, and we have not really got very much closer to a resolution so if you're interested in Javanese history and historiography, you will have come across names like C.C. Berg, like N.J. Krom, H.J. de Graaf, these scholars who, particularly in the, in the colonial period, the second half, the first, sorry, the first half of the 20th century, wrote in Dutch arguing about whether or not Javanese sources were reliable or not. And the discussions they had dragged on, and they didn't really get very far, and we've continued in, in the modern period, the post-colonial period, to talk about these issues. But the facts remain. The historical record is fragmentary and it's conflicting. So the, 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 that fact hasn't changed. Those two facts haven't changed, which means that we still can't work out how reliable the sources are. It's not, we can't think our way out of the problem because the facts are still there. So let me give you a brief example, and I won't I won't kind of go on too long with this, but I do want to make it sort of a bit more concrete so you, that it's clear what I'm talking about. This is a text that I've studied in a bit of depth. Um, I published a paper on this uh, earlier this year on Indonesia and the Malay world. This is the Pararaton. It's a text probably composed in the 16th century in Java, drawing on a large number of fragmentary older materials and putting them together. And it concerns the history of the kings and queens of Java in the 
13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. What I've plucked out here are the statements it makes about three kings, oh, sorry, two kings and one queen of Majapahit, Wakasing Sukha, also known as Hayam Wuruk, Vishesha, his son-in-law, and the sovereign queen, Suhita, who was Vishesha's daughter. And what we have in the one chronicle, we have two completely different chronologies mixed together. So I put them into two columns, but in the original chronicle, it's just a single list. Clearly, two different versions of events were originally two separate documents that got mer merged together in the Pararaton. That is, the new chronicle simply mixed together these two contradictory versions of events. And if you look at it, it's clear. In what year did Wakasing Sukha die? 1311 or 1312? By the way, the, the number in brackets 1389 with the asterisk is the year in the common era in AD, whereas the number uh, outside the brackets is the year in the Shaka year. So it's just to, to, to make it clear why there are two dates for each. But which one is it? Which version of events is correct and which one is wrong? And more importantly, whoever put the, the Paraton together must have realized that there are these, these conflicts. It's not possible to look at this and think this is a coherent account of the deaths and reigns of the kings of Majapahit in this time. So the question is, why was it allowed? Why did the chronicler and the compiler put things together in this way? And my theory my argument about why this was the case is because they could not work out which one was more correct. Because there was no original document they could go back to. So here is the problem of the loss of original documents. That when contradiction or conflict emerged between different versions of events, there was no legitimate way to adjudicate between them, to say this one's accurate and this one's wrong. Because the documents on which they were originally based, the, third, the 14th century documents all the way back, written when Wakasing Suka was alive, written upon his deathbed, saying the new king is here. Those documents no longer existed or they were inaccessible. The past was precarious and therefore you had to, when these internal contradictions emerged, you could not get rid of them, you could not correct them, you could not make it better. So this is a small example of what I find to be a, a, a very general phenomenon. It's found throughout Javanese historiography, this problem of conflicts and contradictions. And my view is the, the most important reason for that is the precarity of the past and not other, other theories have been put forward. But I think that that issue of the lack of access to written documents is the number one cause of these problems. So why does this matter? I feel like I got a bit passionate about that because it's my job. I'm a historian of Java, and so these problems are a big deal to me. I've got to work out, you know, when did the kings live and when did they die, and I've got to deal with these sources and texts. But why does it matter to everybody else? The reason I think it's important is because it illuminates the, the special challenges that we have when we work in Southeast Asia. When we work in societies, not just in Southeast Asia, but particularly Southeast Asia, societies where ma the materiality of writing uh, has these features that, that documents degrade easily, that we don't have a very strong documentary record, that it's quite precarious, that we have these traditions that draw upon conflicting and fragmentary traditions. Ma these situations pertain not just in Java. Of course, they also pertain in other parts of Southeast Asia, and importantly, they also pertain in other parts of the world. An example that I always like to bring up is we see many of similar kinds of things in early English history, the period after the, the Romans had left Britain and as the, as the Germanic tribes were coming in and fighting against the, the pre-existing British Roman peoples. We, we see many sorts of similar problems with chronicles and with, with conflicting traditions as we see in Java. So this is not a culturally specific issue. And that's why I think it's important for people more, broader than just Javanese people or people interested in Indonesia or even broader than Southeast Asianists because these sorts of, sorts of questions are 
more broadly applicable. So this is this is sort of where I end up. Right? I talked about the materiality of writing, which is important in of itself, and and is and I've become increasingly interested in it and engaged with this issue of trying to work out what sorts of writing supports, what sort of writing materials people use back in the day. But for me as a historian, the relevance is, is that arrow. How does it influence and shape the writing of history in Java? And I think what I want to kind of try to persuade you of today is that the materiality of writing is a crucial consideration. And we really need to think as historians, we're used to think of, thinking of sources as sort of texts that float around in people's minds, um, but they're not like that. They're objects that exist in the world. They have a form, they have a physical presence, and that physical presence matters. It has an influence, and over a long period of time, that influence is very, very strong. So let me wrap up. I wanted to make the point that we have a diversity, we, be, we, we seem to have a diversity of writing materials in South, in Java, sorry, pre-modern Java. Not just palm leaf, which many people know about, not just copper and stone, which we have in the museums, but a whole range of other materials that at least there's some evidence they are being used, although we can't be sure because for the ripta, for the organic materials, we don't have the original originals left anymore. So we have to infer through indirect means. The big point I wanted to make about the materiality is how precarious it was. So the fact that Ripta, that organic material, was physically degradable, that it was uh, easily decayed and easily destroyed, led to the precarity of the written record as a whole. That is, documents that were produced throughout Japanese history to record land grants and to record the rise and fall of kings, unless they were copied onto stone and copper, they simply perished. And that meant that Javanese historians, both in the past and today, really struggle. We end up with a fragmentary and a conflicting written record. That makes doing history very challenging. Finally, as I alluded to, I think that this, these sorts of findings can point to a, a broader theoretical understanding of the materiality of historical practice. And these are buzzwords that are popular, materiality, practice, those kinds of things. So that many people thinking around this issue, how is historical practice, the doing of history, how is it embedded in the material, not just material culture, but also the historical practice itself has a materiality to it. And that's something that I'm very interested in kind of learning more about and, and, and studying more. And I think that this sort of case study for pre-modern Java can be a really good way into that. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and also thank um, in particular the South, Southeast Asian Art and Archaeology Program and the center at SOAS um, and also the people who have helped out putting this together and a number of people who have also given their kind comments on some of the work I've been doing. And finally, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jara, for a very interesting approach and also perspective, uh, new perspective, I guess, on how we should approach the, the historiography of uh, pre-modern Java, uh, as well as the uh, pre-modern Japanese history. And uh, for those joining us at uh, Facebook Live, uh, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to uh, write uh, your comments on uh, the comment box, and then we can go through them uh, one by one later, uh, or maybe now uh, in the uh, question and answer question actually, uh, yeah, session. Uh, to start up the quick Q and A, perhaps I, I think we can touch up a bit, uh, touch uh, some points from your uh, talk there uh, before. Uh, there is a you mentioned about uh, what I found mo most interesting is the in the tradition of uh, uh, Javanese. Uh, traditional uh, tradition uh, for writing is that uh, they always making copies of copies of copies of copies, uh, like you said in the, in the talk. And uh, you say also that uh, the archive or the manuscripts actually dispersed in all over the place and uh, uh, almost uh, uh, no one actually collect them in, in one place together. Uh, but then uh, it raised up question about, uh, because making copies of course, uh, 
uh, net resources, uh, net use resources. Uh, this RK, uh, so there's, there will be question about, um, so who made this uh, copies? Who made these copies? Uh, I guess the, the other, in other words, we can say, who has the power to make history or uh, who were the historians in, in Primorian in Java? Who, who, who got to make uh, the copies, who got to make uh, or, or write the manuscript? Uh, maybe yeah. you have some thought on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a very only a very, very small number of manuscripts that we could consider to be, I guess, historical, so kind of traditional chronicles, uh, texts about the history of kingdoms. And at least in the 14th century, which is the Majapahit period for which we have more documentation, uh, we find that the people who are involved in this are generally associated with religious institutions, uh, people who are connected with monasteries, with clerical institutions. The ones that we happen to have are often Buddhist, but that's not by any means a rule or a standard. Uh, we can be sure that, that Shaiva uh, Shaiva clerics were also involved, but the, the the number is so small that it's difficult to make generalizations. Um, that, in, that in general, when we look at the manuscript as a whole, so not just historical works, but poems and literature and religious texts and all kinds of things, we look at the number of people, the type of people who are, who are transmitting them, and we do have a large proportion of people of the Brahmana caste and people who are connected with religious institutions, but by no means exclusively. We have people connected with more remote uh, remote communities away from the, the palaces, away from the, the kratons, uh, for example, in the, the mountains of Merapi and Mababu. We have a very, very rich collection of, of manuscripts that seem to have been produced by, um, by renunciate communities, so sort of ascetic communities that lived in those high areas. So I think that there is sort of cross section of society that's involved. It's not just controlled by kings, for example. It's not just um, uh, naturally, of course, there's a selection process, and we can be sure that many texts were simply not important enough to copy. So it is, it's not as though uh, every single text was valuable. If a text was no longer relevant, uh, if it was about a dynasty that had been destroyed or had been killed, was no longer politically powerful. It's not much reason to copy their life story and their ancestry anymore. So I think that that sort of unconscious or, yeah, that sort of um, letting things just disappear without making the effort to copy them was probably one of the really important factors. So rather than um, sort of that, 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 that natural attrition and selecting certain works to copy and certain works not to copy had an influence, of course, on what the record ended up being. Okay, um, so do you know if there is any instance whether um, from some sort like, um, can I say ancient, ancient uh, inscriptions like stone inscription or metal inscriptions uh, from uh, early pre-modern uh, Java that referred in later pre-modern Java uh, in terms of uh, palm leaf writing or uh, yeah, something like that in organic yeah. material. I think yeah, what yeah. I'm aiming is yeah. uh, I think here is a continuity and disruption. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. I think it's yes. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes. So, for example, we do have a number of inscriptions uh, from central Java and also from Bali, which are clearly copy, uh, they, they, they quote earlier inscriptions. So it says, well, this is an inscription issued in um, the 19, the 900s, but then they quote an older document from the 800s and say, oh, this is, this is how we know this was the case. This monastery has these rights because 60 years ago, there was this document, here it is, quote it, and that's why we're doing this, this, that, and the other. So inscriptions refer to each other to, to a small degree, um, and they sometimes copy. So you often have you know, one inscription with, with, with three or four sections because the, the older document keeps getting copied and copied and quoted. So there is this sense of, there is a sense of continuity, uh, but it's not, it's not super common. But the question of the crossover between, say, when do the manuscript materials quote from the inscriptional materials, that is rare. But for example, in Deshawarnana, this 14th century manuscript text, there are examples of the, the narrator, Prapancha, going to a, 
uh, monastery and asking to see the inscription. So he wants to know about the history of the monastery and its, its estate, how many lands it has. And so he says to the abbot, can you please show me your charter? And the abbot brings out the charter and says, look here, this is all the land we have, this is all the stuff we have. So there is evidence uh, of these charters being used as evidence. They, 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 were, they were not just legal documents, but historical documents and used as such in that time. However, these are exceptional cases. Um, in general, when we look at chronicles like the Pararaton, we can see that there's source material being used, but it's not explicit and it's not clear how. Uh, we can see it's compiling these different things and that there is continuity, but to my mind, the fragmentary character comes through much more strongly. So that by default, you are dealing with fragments, you are dealing with traditions passed down orally and through complicated means. And only sometimes did you have the security of saying, hey, look, here's an original document I can quote. This happens not very often at all. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so now we have uh, questions actually from the uh, participant in the Facebook Live. Uh, one is from Angela Chiu. Thank you, Angela, for joining us today. Uh, the question is regarding the contradiction in dates between facts. Is it possible that the dates were not a priority for the writers or for readers, uh, but that instead other aspects of the text, such as uh, narratives, uh, themes, motif, were in the priority? And could it that the fact that history were written on fragile material and often not copied reflect a perception of the relative significance in the society of history writing compared to other records? I think that's also part of the um, the way uh, uh, older historian approach uh, uh, pre-modern Japanese writing, right? Like, like you say, you mentioned name like uh, C.C. Burke, like. Uh, Chrome, uh, they also talk more about uh, motif themes uh, yeah. the, uh, on, the, uh, on the writing of the Promoter in Java. Uh, your yeah. thought on this? Yeah, um, so I think this is, a, this is a really important question. I think it's a lot of people, uh, this is a lot of people's minds when they, when they hear about this material. For me, it's, the issue is an a issue of a genre. It's clear to me that there are, there are many genres of Javanese writing. It's a very rich literary tradition. And each of those genres has their own um, their own priorities and their own interests. So it's difficult to generalize across the Javanese in general. Um, but it is easier often to generalize within a genre. So to answer your question, there are some genres of historical writing that are that do not are not interested in dates at all. And this is a genre of what I call the heroic biography. Um, some may call it historical romance genre. Texts about Right in Wijaya, um, about the, the, the Mongol invasion of Java in the late 13th century. These are poems. They're much more interested in the thematic structure, narratives, the romanticization of heroic figures in war and in romance, in love, and uh, the, the, the overall arc of, of uh, questions about fate and about justice, these sorts of things. So uh, that sort of genre of historical writing is very important because it gives us a lot of the detail that we lack from the chronicles. However, there, there exists and existed a chronicle genre that is very much concerned with chronology. Um, and this is not, we, we have evidence for it for pre-modern, but also in, in early modern Java and Islamic Java. There are genres of these chronogram, which is the symbolic chronicles, and they're very, very popular. And this, for, for the, for in this genre, within this genre, dates are very much an important priority and the dates in fact become the focus the events are almost secondary it's the chronology that becomes really important so i think that um the the fact of conflict is not due to in the fact of conflict in the in the chronicle genre which is what i showed the example from the paraton a chronicle with internal contradictions in the chronology that chronicle uh, was not due to i think a lack of interest or, or a deprioritization of chronology, but rather, again, through the, to, for the challenges of, of source material and trying to make chronological sense out of, out of a, a fragmented record. And to the second question about um, the relative significance, I mean, I think we sort of touched on this in, in Fanga's first question. I think that's right, that there is perhaps significance, I would say, uh, interest and relevance 
So I said, for example, the epic poems like the Ramayana, Mahabharata, and poems based on that, uh, religious texts, uh, copied much more frequently than chronicles about kings and land grants and this administrative stuff. And the reason, I think, is because those texts had a broad appeal. They were you know, applied to everybody. Everybody can relate to you know, the war between brothers and cousins in the Mahabharata. Everyone can relate to these amazing narrative themes in a way that perhaps what we would narrowly call historical texts about local politics, about you know, the everyday nature of the kingdom, may have had a more restricted relevance. That's you know, one very plausible hypothesis about why these texts perhaps were chosen, not chosen to be transmitted, but unfortunately, it's very difficult to argue from absence. So because the texts are gone, we can't know for sure uh, exactly why some were prioritized, not others. But if I had to guess, that's how it would go. Yeah. Um, on the note of uh, genre and relevance, I guess it would be nice to follow up on the question with uh, questions from uh, our friend at SOAS, uh, Seang Soka. Uh, he questions, uh, could the language, uh, old Japanese or probably Sanskrit and context, uh, for example, commercial or religious purposes of the text, uh, influence the preferred choice of the material, format and tools? Because you mentioned uh, all these uh, different materials. Yeah. Um, I think it does have an influence for sure. Um, so I think that so the stone inscription that I, sto that I showed, the very old uh, West Javanese inscription written in Sanskrit, uh, the script used uh, and the language used very much part of a uh, trans local tradition. Um, which many scholars have studied from the kind of Indian perspective, Sheldon Pollock being one, looking at this prasasti genre of. Pro, uh, royal eulogy, royal praise inscriptions written in Sanskrit. And for that stone, is, it seems to be a, a preferred medium. But then uh, we also have similar stone inscriptions in Old Malay, you know, slightly later period. The, the use of Old Javanese for documentation, for administrative concerns seems to also be a trend, but not an exclusive one. We often have, for example, a single inscription with Sanskrit on one side and Javanese on the other. Old Javanese on the other, and the Sanskrit side tends to be more about praising the king, and the Old Javanese side tends to be more about administrative concerns. But this is not a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence. So definitely, it's a really important consideration that we're dealing in a highly multilingual world, pre-modern Java. I mean, the, the oldest inscriptions in Java are in Sanskrit, and the second oldest are in Malay. Javanese is the third oldest language in terms of the extant record that's used in Java. So, so the Javanese, and that's my point about long distance connections. The Javanese have been, if you want to use the word cosmopolitan, uh, for a long, long time. And therefore, we're dealing with this multiglossic world. And again, my background's in literature, so I like to look at things in terms of genre. And I think that we can think about the different genres of text, different genres of inscription being associated with different languages and also therefore being associated with different materials. And, and the choice of writing uh, something on copper plate versus writing it on lontar, uh, what kind of lontar, to, what kind of palm leaf to use. In, Sun, in Sundanese, for example, there seems to be this distinction between using gabang, uh, gabang palm leaf for more sacred or more valuable texts, using lontar palm for less valuable, less sacred texts. So there does seem to be an awareness of the material choice and the tools, but that's that's um, we need to take that as kind of case by case basis. There's a lot more work to be done, I think, in terms of fleshing those questions out. I think it's very much a very interesting and a really good direction for future research. Yeah, uh, in terms of uh, multi language uh, in uh, in Java, uh, I think I'm I'm wondering actually uh, whether there is hierarchy uh, on language usage uh, in, in pre-modern Java, whether Arroyo has a one preferred language and then the uh, community has a, another preferred language. And I guess that uh, should follow up with the question from Alpin Chang in Facebook that uh, there will be a version of uh, stories, uh, different version of stories, uh, royal version or uh, yeah. rakyat version is said, Maybe uh, for uh, Ramayana, this is a very mm -hmm. 
popular uh, yeah. poem or a story in, in, in Java, in programming Java. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, am, I think that's a really, this question of class is very interesting, or social status, if you want to call it that, uh, different audiences. Um, and it's a it's such a hard question to answer because um, because we don't have we know so little about the pre modern situation in terms of how these texts were preserved. We know so much more about early modern situation, say how Wayang works in the seventeenth, eighteenth, and nineteenth century. We know quite a bit. How Wayang worked in the fourteenth century or the thirteenth century is a much harder question. It's much less evidence. So if we're thinking about, for example. Um, materials like Panjio Hikayat. So, so how historical narratives were were presented, very likely, I think, they would have been presented in different contexts, uh, a, you know, written or a recited version, perhaps in a palace ceremonial context, maybe a performance version. So we know that in Bali there are performance versions of certain parts of the Pararaton, the Kenang Rock story, uh, the story of, of uh, Rangalawe. Uh, used to be at least not maybe not anymore uh, presented in in mask performances in Topeng in Bali, and that would have had a much more mixed audience. You'd have in the context of ceremony, uh, not just aristocrats and and clerics and priests, but also uh, a broad cross section of society. Um, by simply looking at the written textual record, I find it hard to distinguish. This is clearly a palace version. And this is clearly a Rakyat version. I don't think that we can draw that distinction based on the texts that exist. That doesn't mean to say that those there may have been other versions that were very much more clearly uh, aimed towards the people. Um, I have seen some attempts to, to draw out these, these inferences, implications about audience, but I'm not sure that we have enough yet to be really clear about that. We, 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 we should assume, given that that these texts are very concerned with kings and aristocrats, that they were the primary patrons of these texts. Um, but at the same time, sometimes the texts are very negative about kings and queens. Sometimes they're very critical. Uh, sometimes they seem to take the side of the, the rebels, you know? The rebels sound like heroes and the kings sound like villains. So it's not, it's, we can't say, for example, that just because a, a text is focused on a king or focused on the palace, that therefore it, it is uh, serving that palace's interest or that king's interest or is targeted towards that, that king. And the, the situation is unfortunately quite complex, although we always do have to take it into account when we're interpreting it. Who are the people who are, who, for whom this text was written? And that's a question that's always, I think, um, always perplexes us. Okay, um, we've been talking much more in depth about uh, I think solution, I guess at the point. Uh, we can try to uh, make it a more, in more broader note. And uh, there is a question from uh, River Boy uh, that uh, pertaining uh, certain uh, inscription, I guess, uh, Laguna Copper Plate. Uh, mm -hmm. about that, Jenna? And uh, yes. I think. Yeah, I think what I'm trying to do with this is to reframe the question in more general notes uh, uh, um, concerning the material production and also uh, material choice in uh, writing in Java. And then maybe you can uh, compare that with other uh, writing tradition in Southeast Asia. Uh, do you see any commonalities, uh, difference, or maybe uh, some influence uh, among each others? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of use the, the specific question about the Laguna Copper Plate as a point of departure. This is not, uh, of course, my field. And, and I, I know a few colleagues who are who are writing specifically about Laguna inscription. So um, I'd certainly await the publication of their work and, and recommend it to you when it comes out, um, hopefully quite soon. Uh, in terms of the writing system, uh, it's clear to me that that what we have in the Laguna inscription is not necessarily Javanese writing, but the common, a descendant of the common ancestor of Javanese and Malay and if you want to call it Philippines writing. So rather than being directly transplanted from Java, it seems to be this Southern Brahmi family of scripts that became adopted in Java, in, 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 in Southeast Asia, island Southeast Asia as a whole, not just islands, but also mainland Southeast Asia, 
and over the centuries, starting from the beginning of the first millennium, gradually evolving into more and more specialized forms uh, that eventually become distinctively Javanese, Balinese, Sumatran, etc. But um, not clear necessarily that Laguna Copper Plate is directly connected with Javanese writing, although there are a couple of words in there that suggest that maybe there is a connection to Java. Um, so I think perhaps the this question about the Philippines is, is about the general um, written heritage of Southeast Asia in the first millennium and how it evolved into more distinctive forms in other parts. Um, but in terms of a broader question that Pangai, you're, you're framing, which is really important, I think, how does this all connect to different writing traditions? Um, it's firstly, I think that what's happening in Java draws a great deal from the Sanskritic tradition, but is not a derivative of it directly. The reason is it draws directly from, it, it draws in terms of using Brahmic script, uh, originally using Sanskrit language and vocabulary. So living kings described as though they were heroes from the Mahabharata, from Kalidasa. Very, and, and that keeps going on and on to a very late period, even the 14th century, 13th century. So uh, Javanese always have Sanskrit models in mind during the Indic period. But for example, the, the obsession with chronology in Java seems to be different to what's happening in India. Uh, I'm not aware of these long chronicle forms being produced in such an early period in India. Um, it's certainly, and even if they are, it's what the Javanese are doing seems to be, to me, to be more of an outgrowth of the administrative needs of the state. So this, uh, this, this, this need to control the landscape and to, to organize who has the rice fields and who has the legal right to them and that kind of thing. Now, it seems to produce this, this concern for historical writing and historical thinking um, and, and supported by the clerical institutions. In terms of comparisons with other parts of Southeast Asia, um, it's clear that the, the gulf between the, the Shaiva Mahayana uh, kind of influence of Java and other parts of island Southeast Asia uh, and the Theravada influence in the early modern period in mainland Southeast Asia is a sort of gulf difference. If you look at Thai chronicles, Cambodian chronicles of the early modern period, it clearly reached back to the Pali Canon and Theravada texts. So there is, I think, um, we are dealing with sort of parallel and largely separate traditions. Though, of course, I'm not at all a scholar of mainland Southeast Asia traditions, so I can't talk in any de depth or detail about them. But it does seem to me that um, aside from a common influence, perhaps, of Sanskrit culture, uh, writing systems, and, and a, a awareness of the epics, awareness of the kind of the, the tropes and the literary forms of Sanskrit literature in the whole of Southeast Asia. I think that the development of the historical traditions and practices does seem to be a more regional thing. Uh, Java's on its own path. Um, Cambodia, I think, on a different path. Um, but that's definitely, uh, again, that sort of thing is, is a really, a good topic for a collaborative project, getting experts in for different experts, different parts of Southeast Asia really talk seriously about this is what we find in Java. What do you find, you know, in, in your region? Um, and I think that could be very, very fruitful because we do have this tendency, especially in history, focus on what we know best. Um, and I think reaching out to that sort of collaborative project would be really exciting. All right. Um, because of the time constraint, we have to go through some of the last question in Facebook mm -hmm. and, uh, to wrap up the uh, discussions. Uh, I guess uh, we'll just go with the um, a question from uh, Michael Paul Lee Better, uh, questioning about uh, the precarious city. Mm -hmm. uh, well, how precarious is uh, uh, Japanese? Uh, material in, in, in Japanese sense compared to other uh, geographical mm. aspects. And also that would bring us to the question by Angain Gana, uh, how I pronounce that mm. right, about how vigilant we should be in looking at this uh, material from uh, pre-modern Java uh, in terms of uh, precarious city, I guess, um, mm -hmm. of, of, of the past in, in Java. Uh, 
And I guess that also bring up uh, 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 how to to conclude this uh, discussion on uh, how we should approach uh, the history or the historiography of, of Java when we as modern historians are writing about Java mm -hmm. in, in modern time. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just to Michael's question first, uh, I think that we, that's a very hard question. Um, how, are, are certain spaces more precarious than others? I mean, yes, probably, but uh, we don't know very much about how these texts travel. And that's sort of philological work that needs to be done. But it's quite difficult as well because we're talking at such a long time. So we're looking at texts that were written, say, in the 14th century, the latest, the oldest copies we have are from the 19th century. So it's 500 years of transmission. Uh, very, many, very, very many of these texts moved from Java to Bali. So they would have moved through different geographical spaces. And we don't know very much about how that happened. So we look at certain texts and we say, okay, well, it's clear that this text has been in Bali. Copies of this text have been in Bali for maybe 200 years, back to the 1700s or 1600s. But then it must have been put together in Java before that. And how did it get from Java to Bali? Um, there are these these stories about Majapahit falling and people coming to Bali, moving eastward at least. Uh, so starting from Majapahit, going to Blambangan, moving eastwards towards Bali uh, as the Islamic kingdoms rose. Uh, these are very precarious situations. And precarity is not just about uh, physical decay, although that's what I've emphasized here uh, in this talk. There are other kinds of precarity, of course, when you've got regime change, when you've got political instability, social instability, war. Uh, archives, even if they're dispersed, can be very vulnerable. And uh, communities moving around, uh, taking texts with them, their heirlooms, for example. So if, 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 a, if a person, if a society is pushed or a community is pushed out of an area, uh, taking their, their history with them, as it were, uh, to a new place, that's a change of geography and it makes it more precarious. So I can't answer the question fully because the data isn't yet there. But, um, and... There's a risk of being speculative because we don't. We, we sometimes we can't have the data to know how these texts travel through space, but as far as we can have that data, uh, we can we can be assured that precarity came in lots of different forms. And there's no there's no hard and fast rule for saying, oh well, the mountains were safer, for example, than the plains because you know, it was colder up there. Uh, we can't, I don't think, make those sorts of generalizations. Um, or oh, um, Yeah, I, I think that there's always the problem of presentism, especially with the with the Deshawanana, because it's such a it's been so so much used in in his, in nationalist historiography in Indonesia in particular to talk about how the nation state of Indonesia has this precursor in the Majapahit Empire and these questions of what exactly did the Majapahit Empire consist of and how much power did it have. Uh, these are big problems. Thinking of it in terms of, I mean, I'm not familiar very much with IR, so I can't really um, say you know, what you should and shouldn't do. Um, presentism is an issue, and I think the solution is, at least a first, a first attempt at a solution, is to try and focus on the language and the terminology used. It doesn't mean you have to learn old Javanese, but it, but it, it does mean for example, looking at when you look at the relevant parts of the Deshawanana, so you're talking about IR, the Deshawanana says about Majapahit that it is eternal friends, Satata Mitreka, with Siam, Cambodia, Anam. Uh, what does that mean? What does eternal friends mean? Um, at least starting with a vocabulary that, that relates. And that means, you know, uh, getting a translation, obviously, of that text. Robson, Stuart Robson's translation is the one you should use. Uh, get Peugeot's as well, but compare it. Stuart Robson is more reliable. And then also get a copy of the Javanese text and, um, and at, least, at least mention what those terms are. And so you say, be upfront. Okay, um, I'm not a historian, but I am interpreting this term as alliance. I'm interpreting this term as, you know, detente or something. Um, so yeah, be vigilant. Um, read the historical literature if, you, if you're interested, but um, uh, yeah, at least be aware. It sounds like you're pretty aware of the issue of presentism and its dangers. So um, my only real suggestion is try to try to be close to the textual evidence as far as your capability and your and your resources take you. you know.
don't have to learn the language necessarily, but just a bit of vocabulary would probably help, I hope. Um, and sorry, Panga, your, your last point was about what implications does this have for the study of Javanese history in general? Is that right? Yeah. Um, it, there are a couple, I think. Um, the first is that we have to make explicit the fact that the record we have is so fragmentary and not a representative sample. I think if pressed on this issue, most historians would completely agree with it and say, yeah, of course, I understand. Yeah, you know, we, we do have to make, we, we, we do have such a fragmentary record. And no one would deny that. But there is often a tendency uh, to, for us to forget that when we're busy working. So we, we, we just want to get, we want to find out what, what really happened. And so we just assume, well, oh, there's, there's no inscriptions for this period. Probably the state was in disarray. You know, so probably, so we, we, we come up with some explanation for why the record is fragmentary. And we make these inferences. Um, oh, well, there's, there's no text between, there's no, there's no text between this period and this period, which means that, say, the, the later text must be referring to the earlier text with no intermediaries, for example. So we, we take the absence of evidence for particular documents as evidence for their absence. And you say, if you say it like that, it clearly sounds problematic, it is. Um, we, we, we do have this tendency, I think, because we're, we're so used to having to draw so much inferences out of a fragmentary record, make so many assumptions and speculations in order to explain conflict, explain contradiction, um, that we sometimes forget to think, oh, okay, no, can really say that, or is that just trying to make everything fit nicely together when it doesn't actually fit nicely together? And this, this is the point that I made about the Pyroton in my paper. Many historians, I think um, very good historians, made small mistakes because they tried to make something that didn't make sense make sense. They had these, this chronicle with, with the people dying two times in different years, they tried to make it make sense. Oh, well, probably there were two different people with the same title died in different years, or maybe this would happen. You know, so assuming that the text was okay, but the interpretation was wrong. But I think a consequence of the precarity means that we have to be more ready to suggest maybe the text is wrong. Maybe the tradition is just problematic. And given that, given its fragmentary, given its precarity, um, we have to find ways of working around it. I think there's no easy answer because you can't just make stuff up. You can't just say, well, um, it's the text is wrong, so I'm going to give my you know make up my own theory that doesn't connect to the text. But we do, I think, have to be careful and always be aware that we have a tendency to try and make the story fit together, be coherent, make sense, and sometimes we shouldn't do that. Sometimes the the record is just complicated, it's, it's fragmented, and I think being okay with that, accepting it for what it is, maybe you know something that we could do a bit more of as historians of Java. Okay, so on that note, we should uh, end uh, this talk and uh, discussions. Uh, thank you for everyone that has been joining us uh, through the Facebook Live uh, and also for the question and also the comments uh, through the comment box. Uh, thank you, Jara, for a uh, very you. interesting, very provocating uh, uh, talk and also uh, uh, approach to uh, framework in Java. Thank you very much, Banga. Thanks for a really excellent um, moderation. And, uh, and also, thanks for all your support in, in getting this together. I really, really uh, feel privileged and, and grateful to be given the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for those who are hope to joining us again, uh, our next talk will be on 25th of November, next month. Uh, they will be on the SIP. Southeast Asian shipwrecks. Uh, what it is? Uh, just follow up uh, our like our page, uh, the sub page, or if you are preferring uh, mailing list, uh, you can certainly go to the uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies at SOAS website, and then under the contact, you will find tutorial how to get into the mailing list of the center. Thank you so much for your attention, and bye bye.